access the podcast of OA, located deep within Sector 14845 and powered by the Emerald Light of Will. The podcast of OA is your guide to the Green Lantern universe. Hosted by Lantern Myron Rumsey, the podcast of OA begins now. Happy New Year, Green Lantern fans. This is Myron Rumsey from the Podcast of OA, and you're joining us for episode number 154, our first episode of the year 2020. And I am joined by my good friend and soon papa to be, Phil Bova. Phil, my friend, you're you're on the final countdown. We are. <laughs> we are. <laughs> Clock's ticking, but uh, baby's still not coming. So we're waiting until uh see what happens. Uh, uh, baby's due on the 22nd, so we're going to go, if uh, the baby's not here before then, we're going to see the doctor the day after and then find out, you know, what's happening then. A little Simon go Baz, a little Simon Baz does not stick to deadlines. No, no. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny you mentioned that, uh, that uh, the one guy who follows me on Instagram, I had posted a picture of uh, the door uh, where our nursery's at, and I put some letters up there for the name of the baby, and I had marked them out with black ink and I posted about it and I said, you know, baby's coming soon, blah, blah, blah. (laughs) And one of the guys, the guy we had on our uh, podcast, he uh, commented on there because it's five letters, right? And it's five (laughs) letters, it's five letters, no matter if it's a boy or a girl, that's the thing. And he had commented, he put Simon. (laughs) I put, nope. (laughs) And then he put Bruce. (laughs) That's great. That's great. That's awesome. That was awesome. <laughs> so shout out. It was that was good. That was a good good prank. <laughs> so so our schedule got thrown a little off. Uh the last issue of of uh, Green Lantern Black Stars was supposed to come out a week or so ago. It was supposed to come out originally on January eighth. And they uh they changed it to the end of January and I was all set to get ready to do a review and I'm all ready to go and I contacted my local comic shop and they, I said, you know, do you have the issue for me? And he said, uh no, it didn't come out this week. And I had to go out and look online and find out that it had changed. It, it, you know, it wasn't announced or anything and and so I was expecting it and we you and I were gonna we were all set to record and it's like, wait a minute, there's no book. <laughs> Did they ever say why it was delayed or no, no, I, I didn't see anything about why, why it was delayed. It was, it was kind of just abruptly the date was changed and there was really no mention of it. You know, it seems, it seems to be happening, uh, happening a lot with DC comics, you know, more so with Jeff Johns's books. But I, I was just, I, when you had contacted me about that, I was kind of taken aback. I was like, well, I wonder why they would delay that unless they had something that was coming out. That's going to, jump right off the end of it yeah i don't you know? know because um you know that was my first thought was that maybe they wanted to end that right be doing maybe the week before the second season of the green lantern started but there's a two-week gap unless they change the date for that book and move it up a week uh we'll, we'll see we'll see uh, i i don't wouldn't expect that to happen but for whatever reason we uh you and i had to kind of drop back and and punt a little bit so we're going to do a retro review episode uh to start off the new year Mm-hmm. We're going to throw out a nod to the one and only Alan Scott. Yeah, I, I thought, you know, when, when we were thinking about what we were going to do, this year is the 80-year anniversary of Alan Scott's first appearance, Green Lantern's first appearance in comics. And I thought, well, you know, we've been primarily, we always focus on the Silver Age mythology because that's really where the richer publishing history is for the character. But it just seems fitting to, to maybe do, a, if we're going to do a retro review, let's go all the way back to the beginning. So we're going to talk a little bit about All-American Comics number 16 from July of 1940. And then, my friend, you picked out a uh, Green Lantern, Brightest Day, Blackest Night graphic novel from 2002 that is also Alan Scott-centric. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, juxtaposing one up and another, it's kind of funny because you're the one that you got, uh, Bill Finger, uh, uh wrote and mine uh, was written by this guy uh steven siegel who uh, had a lot of influence with bill finger in this the the issue i read so yeah yeah you you can see definitely see the um i don't want to say the the ode to bill finger but definitely trying to keep that style of storytelling consistent with what bill finger did back then and bill finger yeah. legendary writer uh you know you can't do any much better than bill finger no no no, he's noteworthy. And, you know, and, and, and hats off to Alan Scott, too. He's 
he's a Green Lantern that really doesn't get any, he didn't get his due. You know, it's like, I've always felt like the character was like, they didn't know what to do with him. So they, so they, they couldn't call him a Green Lantern. So they kind of called him a Green Lantern. Then they called him the whatever different names. And then they kind of threw him on Earth too, you know, and it's kind of like he, 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 he morphed into it in, in of himself, you know, and it's, I don't know. I've always liked the character though. I always thought he was one of the originals. Yeah. You know, definitely a, you know, a golden age character that, that uh, like all those golden age characters, they uh, became part of earth too. And then during the Kyle Rayner era, they tried to de-age Alan and, and do a couple things that way. Um, but yeah, you yeah. know, he, he hasn't gotten as much love as he should get, you know, really. No, it'd be nice if they if they started if they made a Justice Society book, and I think that's what I've heard. I don't know if the Great and Almighty Bendis is writing it or not, but I I did hear. I thought they were supposed to be making a Justice Society book. But well, yeah, that know. was that was part of the whole uh, thing tied back to Doomsday Clock that uh, you know Jeff Johns right. was bringing back the Justice Society. Um, you know, I want to talk a little bit more about Bill Finger. Did you see the? Um, documentary that came out a few years ago called Batman and Bill. Yeah, I actually have it downloaded, but I didn't get a chance to uh, to watch it yet. But I heard it was really, really good because it, it it gives him the creative. Because I mean, he was the creator of Batman, you know. Yeah, oh, well, definitely. You know, he, you know, he was he was an unsung hero for the creation of Batman, and it's it's a it's a great documentary. It's a tragic story when you when you find out how Bill Finger was treated by the industry in the long run, and he's a very uh, um, mysterious individual in that there's really only a couple of pictures of him that exist. Yeah, and it's and it's it's nice to have it's nice to have the homage paid to him. I mean, Gil Kane took off with with Batman. I think it was Gil Kane. What, am I saying that right? Gil Kane? No, um, Bob Kane. Bob Kane. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, Batman fans, but not sorry. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, it's nice to get a homage paid to it, the, the creator, you know. It, it's also neat because the story, Bill Finger was really championed by an author by the name of Mark Tyler Nobleman. And um, Mark has a, a website called Noble Mania, which I'll put a link to um, in the show notes. But Mark is a really a, an interesting guy. He's a bit of a detective in a, in a way because he tracks down um, unsung characters or little known actors. Uh, he did a whole thing on the, do you remember the Legends of the Superheroes that came out in the 70s? It was kind of cringeworthy, but it was kind of done as a tongue-in-cheek Justice League did you ever yeah, see that? Yeah, I do. I do remember that. Yeah, um, that's available on DC Universe. But he did a Mark Nobleman did a whole thing where he tracked down as many of those actors as possible and interviewed them. And like he's interviewed people that were in music videos in the 1980s. You know, who was who was the girl in the boat in Huey Lewis in 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 um in, in the really if this cool. is it video. He's really a neat guy. And uh, I remember when he was doing his series of uh, stories on the Legends of the Superheroes. Um, he and I corresponded for a little while because he was trying to track down the guy that played Hal Jordan in that uh, whole storyline. And there, there was, that was the first live action appearance of uh, a Green Lantern. And there were, the actor in the show um, was called, oh, geez, Howard Murphy. And he, I was trying to track him down. He was trying to track him down. And we spent you know years trying to do that. And then... Uh, back in 2015, he found out that Howard Murphy was a screen name and that the guy who um, played Hal Jordan, his real name, was Reese Larson. And he was a stuntman and, and started to do, do acting. And basically people, his agent said to him, hey, you know, this show that you're going to do, you're going to get paid for it, but it's not going to be good for your career. So let's come up with a screen name. And so they came up with the name Howard Murphy. And he, he tracked, you know, he tracked the guy down. And when, when he found out about the guy and got his interview with him, he sent me a really nice email and said, Hey, I found him and, and gave me a link to it. And uh, there's an article about that on, uh, on the blog of OA. And then uh, unfortunately the gentleman passed away um, in 2018, but uh, Mark Nobleman was just one of those guys that championed Bill Finger in this documentary uh, that uh, the Batman and Bill uh, has Mark Nobleman in it because it follows his journey as he tries to uh, get Bill Finger recognized by DC Comics as the co-creator of Batman. Hmm, interesting. 
So I highly well, recommend it if, 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 if you guys out there are listening, uh, if you guys and gals out there listening have not watched it, uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, great, great movie. It's a little dry because, you know, it's a documentary and it's him trying to track down how does he get the rights for Bill Finger because he has he has no legal right to to force DC to do it. And so it goes through all the efforts he does to um, research Bill Finger's life in order to get the leverage he needs. Uh, fantastic story. Can't, can't recommend it enough. Uh, but yeah, Bill Finger, uh, co-creator of Alan Scott, along with Martin Nodell, who really came up with everything. It was his idea. Uh, Marty Nodell uh, was an artist who went to New York City to work in the advertising business. And that was kind of the big thing. And trying to get his foot in the door was was difficult. And so he took to doing comics and, and, and actually, when we start talking about all American comics, you find out when you, when you open that book up, it doesn't even have Marty Nodell's name in it. It has Mark Dellen, which is a riff on Nodell. If you take the O-N on the end of Dellen, reverse those letters and put them in the front, you get Nodell. Huh. Uh, Interesting what they used to do back then, you know? Yeah, because, you know, comics were not considered a glamorous business by right. any stretch of the imagination. So uh, he felt it might be bad for his professional career if his real name appeared on the book. Mm. It's real curious. Wow. What yeah. a different time frame that was. Oh, I know. It, it's 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 crazy to think. But uh, yeah, it, it, great, great creators in, in this. And you see a lot of the origins for what we come to know from the modern uh, mythology of Green Lantern come from the Alan Scott stories. So yeah. I, I'm excited to talk about it. Uh, it should be a lot of fun. Cool. Cool. Yeah. We've got a lot to talk about on here. I was looking at the show notes and everything. Yeah. Oh, a lot. Yeah. yeah. We got a lot of stuff. So uh, let's take a quick pause, come back. Uh, cause, cause your lovely lady's wife could water her break. Could, her water could break any minute. <laughs> that, <laughs> would that be something? Oh my God. Boy, yeah. that would, that would be great podcasting. <laughs> All right, well, let's take a quick pause and we'll come back and we'll start talking. We've got some Greenlander stuff to talk about before we do comics, but uh, we'll be right back. All right. What up, dweebs? This is Guy Gardner. You're listening to the podcast of OA. So, Phil, there's been um, some... Green Lantern news lately, it, it, you know, it's funny. It's been kind of uh, a dry period for a while, and now things are, the steam is really starting to pick up. But uh, I don't know if you watched the Arrowverse Crisis on Infinite Earths event. Uh, did you watch mm-hmm. it? Oh, yeah, I watched them all. It's great. Love uh, it. Fantastic. I, I want to say that's probably the most ambitious event, TV or film, comic book related ever. Uh, because oh, the, it was fantastic. The storytelling was amazing, and the, oh, the writing yeah. was great. And, and, and the cameos to see Burt Ward oh. and and the, the young lady who played uh, the Huntress and Birds of Prey and uh, Marv Wolfman's cameo was priceless. Uh, and let's not forget about uh, uh, the last cameo, man, the big one that was kept under wraps. Yes, yes. It's amazing to see both flashes together. That was so cool. And uh, yeah. there was some Green Lantern stuff in there. Now, you know, everybody was expecting John Diggle to become John Stewart. Uh, I, I personally was not a fan of that idea. I think John Diggle's a strong enough character on his own. But, uh, you know, we've been wanting to see Green Lantern referenced in some way, shape or form. And one of the things that they did was they tied the monitor's origin to Maltus, which all Green Lantern fans probably know Maltus is the planet where the Guardians and the Zamorans and the Controllers all originated from. So that was cool. Yeah. Uh, but the most exciting it's, it's thing... It's a nugget. It's a nugget in there. Yeah, you know. it's, it's a little nugget. They, they talk just a crumb there. But then when you get to the finale, and, and, and folks who have not seen it, I, you know, I, we're going to spoil a little bit, So although we've already spoiled a little bit already. Uh, the, the ending, uh, Oliver Queen talks about the birth of the new multiverse. So what they did in this event is they didn't, uh, they didn't kill all the universes and combine them together into one. Although they did that with all the Arrowverse shows. So Supergirl and black lightning and all the other Arrowverse shows are now all on the same earth, but they created, it was almost like they did. I, you know, they did 
a crisis on infinite earths and infinite crisis together because it spawned basically a new multiverse. And in the end, they have this little video they show of uh, Oliver talking about the birth of the new multiverse. And he, they show you the earth that, uh, that doom patrol is on and the swamp thing TV show and Titans and the new star girl show. But then they show earth 12 and they used footage from the 2011 green lantern movie which I thought was really interesting. And, you know, of course, it, everybody's wondering, well, does that mean that the movie's in continuity or was this a placeholder for the HBO Max show? And I kind of feel it's the latter. I don't know about you, Phil. I mean, I, I feel like the, the multiverse thing is like DC's go-to theme. You know, have you felt... I mean, they've been, they've been pulling the strings of the multiverse thing for, oh God, years now. You know, and they really, really, really expounded on it a lot when the flash came on the air, you know, it's just really, it really started taking off. And then you started reading about it more in the books and everything like that. And of course, you know, the great and almighty, uh, Grant Morrison wrote his multiversity, you know, and, and I don't know if you, you I think I remember you saying you didn't read, uh, the multiversity books he put out, but I don't know. It's really, really cool to see it hashed out on, on the screen, but I, I guess that's how they're going to, to do the whole tie in thing from the, from the main DC extended, which is their multi, which is their movie and the television series. And then HBO max. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how they're putting all these pieces together. Yeah. It's like, you know, they're all like kind of on their own little pieces of continuity, but they all exist in one giant multiverse, which, which is cool. You know, you saw things where they tied in the Batman 89 movie and, and they tied in the movie universes and all the movies we've seen, all of it, all of it, happened essentially you know it was all one big continuity just all didn't all take place in the same universe which falls very much in line with with the whole dc multiverse history so i I was excited by the whole thing i I, the the ending i I about came up out of my chair (laughs) well you know the the thing i could really play in their favor if warner brothers thought to do this right and i hope that's what they're thinking is is they could play the multiverse in such a way that it that it distances themselves from these these movies that have caused strain on their, on their, on their business venture, you know, like justice league and Batman versus Superman and green lantern for that matter. You know, you, you could play those in a way that, okay, that's a multiverse concept. So that's why there's some kind of tie in to it, but you can still branch out and go further beyond it and get away from that. You know, right. They can acknowledge kind of some of the stumbles and still right. celebrate them as a part of the greater universe at large. Uh, you know, right. I, I see nothing wrong with that. I, I think it's a it's a brave and bold uh, pardon the pardon the pun. It's a brave and bold strategy. I mean, it really is. I mean, if that's the, if that's the the thing they're doing, I mean, it would be it would be good marketing at their point because I mean, let's be honest here. Their their movies haven't gotten a good rap. I mean, above and beyond Wonder Woman, Aquaman, and Shazam, you know. But everything else is always considered questionable before those movies and. And for Warner Brothers, that has to hurt a little bit because they lost a lot of money with Justice League from what they probably shelled out. Same for Batman versus Superman, you know, and I know it's all about making the big bucks. And we've talked about that ad nauseum. But to a certain degree, I mean, storytelling, you know, you have to be have creative storytelling. And that's why Patty Jenkins did so well with with uh, with Wonder Woman. And that's why um, what's his face did so well with Aquaman. I mean, they were just they were allowed to create, they were allowed the freedom to do the storytelling. And that's why the movies did so well. Right. Right. Now, of course, the other big thing is uh, HBO max, more details are coming about, about the uh, green lantern show. And uh, just this week there was, uh, I don't want to say it's kind of a major announcement. I mean, obviously no casting has been uh, announced yet, but um, some initial details have come out. And one was that the show is going to take place over several decades, whether that means we're going to have flashbacks or it's literally going to have like, you know, it's going to take place in a, for a while in one decade and then it's going to jump forward or backwards from there. I, I don't know. Or if it'll be like the Arrowverse shows where every episode's got a piece that takes place during one time period and another piece that takes place in another time period. That could happen. Um, mm-hmm. But the other the other thing was that the show is going to focus on the origins of two uh, well-known Earth Green Lanterns. Um, and then it's going to include Sinestro. So, so you, you, you posted about that on Instagram and, you know, you had some people that were commenting on it. And I put my two cents worth in, and, you know, I, you but you you 
harken back, didn't they mention something along the lines that it was going to be some kind of like a buddy cop kind of show or whatnot? But I don't think that HBO Max is, is spinning it in that kind of fashion anymore. Right. When, when, when they were talking about the Green Lantern Corps movie, that was kind of how it was initially described. But again, that goes right. back to before Jeff Johns was doing the script. You know, there's, yeah. there's, there's some things that are legacy from that time period when, you know, the, the Green Lantern Corps movie was going to come out this year and uh, people were working on it and it was being described as a buddy cop film and it was going to be John and Hal. And the rumor was that Hal was going to be older and John was going to be the young guy and it was going to be a riff on um, a very um, literal riff on lethal weapon kind of a thing. And, and that stuff's all out the window at this point. Uh, yeah. b- but this show uh, is, is it's going to be interesting because it's going to have, um, you know, two major green lanterns on it as well as Sinestro. So the question I, I, I want to ask, and you, you know, you mentioned talking about it a little bit on Instagram is what two green lanterns do you want it to be? And what two Green Lanterns do you think it's going to be, if if you think it's different? Um, uh, my, mine's not different. Mine's the same. I I still I think they're going to do. I think if Warner Brothers, I think they have to pull the diversity card when it comes to a movie like this, and they they have to they have to have a female character of some sort. Just my opinion. So I think they're going to pull. I think they're going to do Jessica Cruz, and I, I think it would be good for them to do that because she has gained a lot of stature. I mean, over in Odyssey, she's still going strong and, you know, she's, she came from nowhere and she's, she's high in the ranks now. And then I thought maybe I hoping how Jordan would be the other one, but you know, we can't tell. I swear if they pull Simon Baz, man, I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you, you want to see Helen Jessica and you think it's going to be Helen Jessica. Yeah, that's what I think. I mean, I find it hard to believe that they're going to, that they wouldn't do a how. I mean, Kyle Rayner would kind of make sense, but I just don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm at a loss with this one because I, because there's so many different things they can do. And as a big, big fan like you and I are, man, I just don't want to be met with the disappointment. You know, I mean, if, I mean, to, to like a Guy Gardner, John Stewart, you're going to upset a lot of Hal Jordan fans. You know, a lot. I think <laughs> um, for me, I mean, the first thing I from my perspective is, you know, I, I hear people talking about whether saving Hal and John for the movie, and. You know, we just got done talking about Crisis on Infinite Earths. Uh, Having two Barry Allens, a a movie flash and a TV flash, hasn't hurt either one of them. Having uh, two um, versions of Superman, not a problem. So why can't there be two versions of John and Hal? So uh, for what I would like to see, um, I would like it to be Hal. I mean, to me, you can't do Sinister without Hal. That, That relationship is the strongest hero villain relationship in Green Lantern mythology. So that's why I think Howe would be in this one. If they're yeah. gonna have Sinestro, they kinda of have to have Howe as a counterbalance. So so I see how. So then the question is is who's second? It, it, who would I want to see? Um if it's gonna be an Earth Lantern, I think I would want to see John just because I think there's a good chance for interplay between the two. Who I think it's gonna be, I think you're right. I think it's gonna be Hal and Jessica. Um and I, not because I think that Jessica is necessarily um, as much of a major Green Lantern as that line says, but for the very reasons you talked about, for the diversity angle. Um, yeah. I, and unfortunately, we live in a we live in an era where we're making decisions based on that versus what makes the best stories. But whatever. Uh, but I think I think personally, my own opinion, that's what it's going to be. Um, we could both be well, very agreed on that. I mean, I mean, it, it just, I mean, I don't know. I'd like to see Kyle. I think Kyle would be a Kyle. Jessica would be kind of a cool, uh, cool pair up. I don't, I mean, you could, you could all, you could still pull in Carol Ferris and Kyle did have a relationship with Sinestro. A lot of times he had a relationship with Saranic not to you're, you're fired. <laughs> Sorry, man. I mean, I'm just saying, I mean, that could be something that they choose to do. Kyle. I mean, and Kyle is a diverse character, you know, with his heritage. I don't know, man. That's, uh, that's tough. I don't know. And you know, Warner brothers is going to, well, they're going to do what they want to do. Doesn't right. matter what the fans want. That's very true. That's very true. Uh, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens either, either way. I, I'm excited to find out more if it ends up being, um, a Simon Jessica, I probably won't even watch it. I know that, you know, <laughs> how can I be a Green Lantern fan and not watch a Green Lantern TV show? But I, I yeah. But anyway, um, so other things that are going on right now, 
uh, Todd McFarlane and McFarlane Toys has got the license to start doing DC figures. And they oh. released pictures of the first set of figures. And uh, one of the first figures is a John Stewart figure uh, based on Justice League Animated. The dude, man. That dude's toys are awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I can't They've wait. always been awesome. I, I, I'm more interested in seeing some of the more original character designs for the figures. Because, you know, this is a riff on, I think there's a Batman and a, and a John Stewart figure that are based on the Justice League animated show. Maybe it's Superman. I can't remember now. But uh, I, those are fine, but they're based on models that exist that they're trying to emulate. And I'm really more interested in seeing the original sculpts of figures that they create based on the comic book characters that have a little bit more of their own artistic flair in them. So I, I can't wait to see what happens with that. Yeah, McFarlane, man. I mean, he's just he's been around for a long time. Oh, yeah. Um, and and the other the other thing to talk about is uh, that uh, the twenty first of January is Green Lantern Legacy. It's the the young uh, readers novel that comes out, a uh, graphic novel that has uh, John Stewart is in it, um, and it has uh, a, a a young um, Asian American uh, Green Lantern character. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to buy it. Uh, just not comes out on my birthday, man. Oh yeah, I mean, well then you know, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then, let's imagine this. So it comes out on my birthday. Let's say my baby's born on my birthday, and then Green Lantern Legacy comes out on my birthday. Right. And, and that's a whole lot of coincidence right there. That's right. You know, and, and little Simon Baz might come out that day. <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> <laughs> Simon B. Bova. <laughs> <laughs> but uh that's, all right so so anyway we, we've got some comics to talk about let's just jump right into it let's jump right into all american comics yeah, from 1940 cool. uh you know so we talked about a little bit when we, we opened the show up talking about uh martin nodell and um you know martin nodell does the artwork in, in this issue that we're going to talk about and it's interesting to look back at the whole thing now i i have it you know, this story was, was was printed in the Green Lantern Celebration of 75 Years hardcover. And so I have it from that, but I uh, I was looking at the original copy of it. The original copy is out on DC Universe. You can read it if you're a subscriber. And I didn't realize that that issue was close to 40 pages or so because it had, you know, back then a lot of the process was taking old newspaper strips and putting them in there. So in this same issue, there were some Mutt and Jeff comics and some other ones. There were some comic strips in the book as well. So I thought that was kind of interesting that it was a hodgepodge of, of newspaper strips and original content. Yeah, that's really, really cool. And, uh, you know, as we talked about, uh, Martin O'Dell did not uh, go by his real name. So he's got a pen name that he's using for this. And uh, he he basically got inspired for the Green Lantern character by seeing someone working on the subway carrying a railway lantern and uh, by looking at uh, Greek culture and, and so on. So that's where the very distinctive design of Alan Scott's Green Lantern costume comes from. Which is a cool costume. I still consider that day it's one of the best costumes. It, it, it's, it, I mean, it, it's got, it, everybody rips on it, but I think it's cool. It's neat. It's very much of the time. Um, and, yeah. and and Alan Scott's origin is also very much of the time. You know, if you look back at characters back then. Yeah, it um, really is. I mean, taking the train out. What did you take the train? Yeah, you know, he's, he's on the train and the train collapses. And somehow he, sur- he survives a train fall from, it's got to be close to 100 feet in the air. And he's on a train and he survives the fall. And he's like the only survivor. Yeah, of, of about like, a hundred, like a lot of people. <laughs> and he, he's an engineer. Um so he's he's got this bridge design and, and he's going to get a government contract and he's an engineer that's in charge of the construction of this bridge. And he's with his buddy and they're worried about uh, a rival construction company. And what ends up happening is the train falls to its demise and there's a lantern, a railway lantern that's on the train that suddenly speaks to him. And uh, there's a prophecy. There's there's a three time prophecy, and it's you know the basically the lantern says three times shall I flame, green first to bring death, second to bring life, and third to bring power. And the first time when they tell the the tale of it, it was in ancient China, and they talk about the uh, meteor crashing with the green flame, mm-hmm. uh, which was kind of retconned into being the star heart and and part of a green lantern power battery from uh Jan Ger, uh which we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit but um which uh which side note it could have some kind of uh it could have some kind of coincidental attachment to that green lantern 
out of uh, that's coming in uh, a legacy. Could it could there could be connection there? You're very very right. Um, <laughs> so far, stretch. Sorry, go on. <laughs> no, I, I you know it, it might not be. It might be very very close to being what happens. But um, they they take the metal and and this um, Oriental individual, this Chinese man, builds a Chinese lantern out of this out of the slag of this molten green metal, and they think that he's a demon because. Uh, you know, the village is very, uh, very superstitious and they believe he's evil and uh, the lantern brings death to the village. And that's the first part of the prophecy. And then the lantern somehow uh, ends up in America uh, outside of a, an asylum for the insane. And uh, this gentleman uh, finds the battery and uh, he takes the, the lamp and he makes a, a railway lantern out of it. <laughs> I mean, please explain to me how a mental patient would get a hold of a lantern and then still take it and forge a railway lantern. <laughs> well, that is comic books in the 40s, friends. The, the, the funny part is they find it on the top of a trash heap in a garbage can. <laughs> so, so they find it like, hey, let's give it to the crazy old guy that uh, this crazy old coot, as they call him. Uh, he makes lanterns out of metals. And he'll like this green lamp. So they give him the Chinese green lamp and he fashions it into another lantern. And again, it talks to him again. And uh, this time it gives life and it basically restores his mental health. And so he gets a new lease on life and goes off and walks out of the insane asylum, a cured man. Go him. And then somehow (laughs) uh, the lantern ends up on the very train that Alan Scott's on. And it gives him the power of the green lantern and it tells him to make a ring. And so he goes and uh, he finds, you know, his friends are dead and he's walking among these corpses with this lantern in his hand. And, uh, you know, he gets away from it and he's like, he wants vengeance on the guy that caused the train accident. He forges the ring and uh, the ring allows him to charge and he f- he learns that he can fly. And it even, you know, they even make allusions to, you know, this was powered by willpower. And he finds the guy's place and he wants to go in and really get revenge on the guy. Um, he figures out that he can go through the fourth dimension, which allows him to go through objects. Again, thank you, 1940s comic books. Um, awesome. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes through and he ends up fighting them. And there he discovers that he can repel bullets, but he finds out about the wood weakness. And so I don't know originally why they decided to make wood the weakness, but what they did retroactively is they, when they tried to tie Alan Scott into the Silver Age mythology, they came up with the story of Yalan Gurr. And Yalan Gurr was a Green Lantern who, um, I don't want to say he abused his power, but he got very cocky about what he could do with his power ring. And so the Guardians of the Universe, to teach him a lesson, they basically made his, his ring weak to wood because that was what the um, the Neanderthal men used as clubs, and he was beaten to death. So here's a guy with the most, one of the most powerful weapons in the universe, and he was beaten to death by guys with clubs. And, hey, uh, uh, just out of just out of curiosity, isn't remember that deleted scene? Or remember that scene that was in uh, Justice, uh, League. Justice League? Yes, wasn't that Yellen Gurr? That was Yellen Gurr, and in fact, if you go back and watch the movie, you'll see that the design for the character in the movie echoes the design from the comics, which is based on the outfit that Alan Scott has. So it has a very similar design to what Alan Scott's classic outfit is, even down to the the boots with the crisscrossed laces. Um, that was intentional to try to tie that all together when they tried to make Alan Scott fit more into. Um, the Green Lantern mythology, not that he was ever a member of the core, but they tried to show how it was all connected. Um, oh. But yeah, Yalan Gurr was, was that, that Green Lantern. But anyway, he, he's ended up fighting these guys by fisticuffs. He, he gets knocked out, but he, he wakes up and he's, he, he punches these guys out and then he takes the guy that in charge of this gang of people in this rival construction company and he flies up in the air with him and threatens to drop them. Unless he will sign a confession, he signs a confession, and then he passes out from shock. He and he dies. He has a heart attack, and so Poor then, guy. yeah. So then Alan decides to design a costume, and he decides to use his ring to to fight evil, as any as any person would do in the 1940s. That's right. That's right. Well, you know, then this this was 1940, so this is this is you know about a year before we enter into World War II. Um, this that was a seven page story, and it's quick. 
It well, but you know, like the Batman one was really quick. You know, his origin story was really fast. <clears throat> Same with Superman's. Yep. Those real early comics were good. But yeah, but you know, the Bill Finger writing is obviously, you know, it's it's of its time. But yet there's a lot of little things in there. Um, Marty Nodell's artwork. Um, and again, you got to remember it's the 1940s. Uh, this was like, you know, get these books out there quick. Uh, so there's a lot of blank backgrounds. Um, the art doesn't hold up to today's hyper detailed artwork, but it still tells the story very effectively. And it's cool. I like the cover. That's one of my favorite covers. Yeah, yeah, it's neat. Um, you know, Chad over at uh, the Lantern Cast has a Green Lantern 80th anniversary logo that riffs on that cover. Um, That's me. That'd be neat. Um, I wonder how much this book is going for, the original. I- I'll bet you it's going for a pretty penny right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but again, it was interesting. This was only seven pages out of a, I th- want to say it was a 40-some-odd page comic book. But it, but it tells the story in seven pages. And you look at you look at today's deconstructed storytelling and how the pace is so much slower. And, and look at how much you get done in seven pages. Yeah, no kidding. And you know, on, a, on a note to that, those seven pages are now worth $110,000. Oh, is that how much it is? You look it up? That's cool. Yeah, so that's with the 6.5 rating. Wow, <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, you know, those golden age books are worth so much money because of their scarcity. But then when you take a book like this, that's a, an origin of a classic iconic character, uh, that makes it worth even more. Yeah. No kidding. You know, it's funny. You always hear the stories about people that used to, I mean, back in the days they, <clears throat> they didn't have anything to keep warm with. So a lot of what people used to do is they'd stuff newspaper and paper into the, the walls of their house to keep the, to keep the warm air in. And keep warm inside and they used to do the same thing with comic books yeah yeah well and, and then you, you you had the the paper drives during world war ii so a lot of comics disappeared because of that and then during the seduction of the innocent era there were comic right. book burnings so a lot of these books yeah. just didn't survive um one of the things i wanted to point out uh it, on the cover and when alan scott first puts on his power ring he puts it on his right hand but later in the issue, it's on his left hand, uh, which is one of you, you always know, you know. One of my pet peeves has always been the ring not being on the hand at all or changing yeah, hands. I'm saying that. And yeah. uh, it, it happened right here in the very beginning. <laughs> there's there's a lot of panels where the ring is not even there. You can't see it unless you know unless they want to draw attention to it. It's not on the panel. But then eventually the ring goes from the right hand to the left hand, and that that became his uh, one of the things that set him apart um, was that the ring was on the left hand. You know, it's kind of a bummer because on the front, on the, the cover <laughs> where he's standing on that, that beam or whatever, he kind of looks like he has the pens on or something. Yeah, yeah. He's a little, uh, yeah. <laughs> but again, that's, that's that 40s style, you know. Um, the it interesting is, thing about really the is. ring on the left hand to me is back in that day, left-handed people were considered evil. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the, 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 word, for, the word for left in uh, Latin is sinister. Yes, which is also why Sinestro has always had the ring on his left hand. Did not know that, but that's that came together really well for us, didn't it? <laughs> it's nice how that worked out. That worked out the way I want to say it was as planned, but it wasn't. But yeah, that that's yeah. how. But it was interesting to see a hero that had um, a predominant left hand, considering the fact that people thought it was evil. I mean, I have a a woman that works with me who uh, she's not much older than I am. So she's she's in her her mid fifties and she told me a story about when she worked in a pharmacy when she was younger, that she had a customer that would not allow her to wait on her because she was left-handed. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. I mean, people <laughs> always thought there was some associated with the evil cause you're at a left hand. I mean, it would, I don't know. That goes back to ancient history. Romans, Romans thought that the left-handed were evil too. That's probably where it originates from. But uh, yeah, all American comics, number 16 from 1940, definitely one of the most important issues of comics when it comes to Green Lantern fans, for sure. Whether you, whether you like Alan Scott or not, you have to pay respect to this is where it all started. In fact, the, uh, you know, Alan had his own oath for a while, but at one point um, the oath was changed. Alfred Bester, the science fiction writer, wrote some comics and he came up with the Green Lantern oath that Alan Scott used, which became the oath that we all are very fond of that Hal Jordan and the Silver Age mythology used that actually originated in the Golden Age. Interesting. Good stuff, man. Good history. Yeah. <laughs> the more you know, you know. Um, but anyway, right. 
let's let's take a quick break. And when we come back, let's start talking about Green Lantern, Brightest Day, Blackest Night for 2002. All right. Listen up, Lanterns. It's time you took the oath with Green Lantern John Stewart. In Brightest Day, in Blackest Night, don't let the podcast of Oa escape your sight. But those who worship evil's might, beware my power. Green Lantern's Light. All right, everybody, welcome back. Thanks, Myron, for that awesome, awesome, awesome All-American Comics retro review. Alan Scott, a great character. So when we jump into mine, it's kind of a nice mirror reflection to yours, um, because obviously it, uh, the train uh, kind of revolved around the train and whatnot and the, the travesty that happened. But So we're going to go into mine. Mine's Steve, written by uh, Steven Siegel, not Seagal. Uh, art by John K. Snyder, and it was published in 2002. And I did a little research into to Snyder's art, you know, and he's he's done random stuff here and there, but not a lot of big, big things. But his art style is quite unique. I don't know if you do have this issue, or did you have digital, or? Um, I do not have it in paper, but I do have it digitally. Um, and yeah. yeah, you know, and it's painted. So I've always really yeah. admired the, the comic books that are using a painted work by artists because I think it requires another level of talent beyond just doing pencil and ink. And you can see it's very stylistic. Uh, Todd Klein does the lettering, which is, you know, good. But John Snyder's artwork really pops and he's got some unique takes on Solomon Grundy. Solomon Grundy's maybe a little more lank, lanky than what yep. you, would, you would think, but the paint style in the artwork is great. There's a, there's a picture early on where you see uh, one of the Germans put on a face mask on a plane. And that image is just so great. Um, there's a oh, lot that, of, that, oh, I see what you're looking at right now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where he pulls it down. That yeah, looks like Cobra down. Commander. Yeah, he, it almost reminds me a little bit of Cobra Commander. But yeah, there's a lot of neat images that you get You get some different textures and shading with the paint that you don't get with inks. And it, it just, it's gorgeous. It's a gorgeous book. And you can tell in a lot, of, uh, a lot of what was taking place here, obviously, you know, keep in mind, like, when Bill Finger, and when you talk about with All-American Comics... You know, the world as we know it wouldn't have known what a Nazi was. You know, uh, it wouldn't take it would take years for the American culture to fully grasp the Nazi terrors that took place during World War Two. So it's kind of juxtaposed to the era that Bill Finger and them grew up in going into the war and then introducing them in this later edition that kind of reflects a lot of the origin story of Alvin Al- Al- Scott in a different way. And then includes Solomon Grundy in there. Yeah, and Solomon Grundy was was is has always been a, a fun character, but I don't I don't know where their connection came together, but Solomon Grundy often appears in stories with Alan Scott in it, and uh, I I just thought this book was neat. I love how they did the word balloons for Solomon Grundy being this odd shape, and that the lettering is very uh, primitive or juvenile looking, mm-hmm. kind of like Bizarro, you know, like how they do with Bizarro. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. But uh, so we got Alan Scott. And uh, now at this time, I would assume that he's probably already a mon- member of the Justice Society. Yes, I, I think so, because because the Justice Society does show up here. Right, 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 right. So this. Hold on, I got to go to what page that was on. And he also knows a person by the name of Irene Miller. Um, this this 19. They, they categorize her as like a 1930s broad. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know if Irene. I don't know if Irene Miller is part of any kind of uh, canon when it comes to Green Lantern. Yeah, I, I don't recognize the name, and you know he he does get married uh, in the comics, but he does not get married to her. Um, oh, he does. He doesn't get married to her. No, and I'm trying to remember his wife's name. Um, it is starting to. Uh, gosh, I cannot remember her name. It's going to bug me now. I'm going to have to look it up while we're talking. But I, yeah, he does get married, but not not to her. And it's interesting that, that uh, Alan Scott's got four names. His, his full name is Alan Ladd Wellington Scott. And I kind of wonder if Alan Ladd was part of, uh, part of you know, the, the, he, was, he was a famous actor, whether that was on purpose, purpose or not. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to tell. Uh, so they want, he wants Alan Scott to, to be uh, like on, on the radio from what I gather from the story, from the, the odd, the quirk of the storyline. It's a, 
it's like uh, some kind of retroactive story on the on a radio personality for which is on Gotham's WGAH. Yeah, yeah. That was a radio station, which is kind of that's kind of a, a quirk little thing. And it, of course, which is an odd to Bill Finger, which would be a nod to Batman at that time. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of those comparisons going on in here, you know, and it's and it's kind of funny because of how um, how Snyder's Snyder's and Sneagle's work kind of like go into that whole broader image of him being of Alan Scott being a weird figure, kind of like uh, Nodell and uh, Finger did like that. They compare him to like a green ghost. Yeah, kind of. Kind of. Oh, his wife's name was Molly Maine. Molly Maine, huh? Molly Maine. Yep. She was a villain by the name of the Harlequin, and she was reformed. Huh. That's really interesting. I did not know that. I did neither. I had to look it up. <laughs> uh, okay. So let's see. So uh, Alan Scott, uh, the plane goes down in the swamp, and this is where he ends up running into Solomon Grundy again. And of course, he has to fight the Nazis at the same time. Nazis in a swamp. I mean, what, what better thing can you have, you know? <laughs> right, right. And, it, you know, Alan now, Scott's putting right in the middle. <laughs> now, I, odd question. Did they, did they say where this plane crash was, where it took place? Oh, well, it's outside of Gotham. I'm not sure how far, but it's someplace where um, they were able to, you know, Doi B. Dickles gets, uh, gets used to drive the, the young female reporter to the plane crash site. So it's got to be somewhere near Gotham because that's where they start from. Yeah, that's true. And of course it shows the original, uh, Alan Scott oath and I shall shed my light over dark evil for the dark things cannot stand the light, the light of the green lantern. Ne- Good ne- throwback. Ne- yep. Yeah, definitely a neat throwback. Need to throw back. Uh, so the battle ensues in the swamp and then oh, here comes Solomon Grundy shows up. Which he, they really, really capture him like in this eerie, like swampy kind of form, almost like Swamp Thing in a way, but uh, obviously different, which it's kind of cool because the one thing I like about Solomon Grundy is if you go back to Blackest Night, Solomon Grundy, he was in an issue that was the precursor to Blackest Night. Right. Did you know right. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because at the end he uh, foretold the prophecy or whatever. It's interesting that that, so, that the, the version of Grundy reminds me a lot of Frankenstein. Yeah, it really does look at that. It has a lot, it had a lot of those elements in here, especially that page where they just show Grundy when he's got his just you can barely you can see his head and it, the rest of him is all black and then you yeah. can see the word bubbles in there. Yep. Yeah. 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 I, buried I, on Sunday. Very very stylistic. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So then Alan Scott shows up. He's here to help. At ease, boys. I'm here to help. And then, of course, got to appreciate the golly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah they, they, they definitely maintained the era. You know, they, they kept it true to the era. They didn't try to modernize it. They kept it in the 40s. Um, so the, a lot of the phrasing is that way. Uh, a lot of the storytelling is that way. And like, like, like we said before, it's very much an ode to uh, Bill Finger out of this. And also, did you recognize the general's name? Look at his last name. Oh, where is it? Zechariah oh, Nodell. Yes. G- General Nodell. Yep. Yeah, that's really cool. So, of course, the Nazis are still in the swamp. I guess he's building some kind of Zeta wave, right? This, this yeah, there's a there's a scientist that's on the plane, and that was why they hijacked the plane and crash it. And uh, right. they're carrying this beam, which allows you to turn things invisible. And so the Nazis want that so that they can take over the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and uh, so they're basically holding this guy hostage and trying to uh, get him to make the thing work. And they happen to use the land in the swamp with the plane where Grundy is. And so Grundy's fighting them just because he's Grundy. And then Alan Scott shows up and Grundy wants to fight both of them. And Alan is just trying to, you know, figure out what's going on. And he's been sent there right. by the government to try to, to, they don't even tell him what the, what the, what the invention is. No, they don't. And this poor girl gets <laughs> That one poor girl gets captured. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the middle of all of it, poor little girl. And then, okay, so then Grundy. That's when you. So that's when you go to the end. I guess that's what you're talking about, where uh, Alan Scott when they show his split, trying to figure out which way is right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He and he tries to talk Solomon Grundy out of killing people because you know Grundy doesn't care about human life, so he's no. trying to he's trying to stop Grundy from killing these guys, but he wants to stop them. Right. Okay, so then the fight between Alan Scott and Solomon Grundy ensues, and they go out back and forth. And I really like that split page where they show Grundy holding that big old piece of that big old stick. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and then Alan Scott's coming at him with the green light. Of course, yeah. and then there's Irene. I guess it's Irene. Irene shows up at the end. Yep, yep. She gets captured. She gets captured. Damsel in distress. Common trope. What did you think and about I how had, uh, Alan Scott gets rid of Solomon Grundy? Where am I at here? What page are you on? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm ahead of you, I think. You're, web, you're probably way ahead of me. Yeah, I am. I'm about six or seven pages ahead of you. Sorry. That's okay. But, uh, Grundy, oh, what you Grundy, Grundy, Grundy wants them all dead. That's the thing. Yeah. I'm trying to see where he, where he, oh, I'm trying to see where he, uh, is that where he puts him in the ring? Oh no, he hits him, he gets hit by the train, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. So you've, you've got Alan Scott telling him it's, it's wrong to take a human life. And then he kind of lures Grundy out onto the train tracks with a, a construct image of himself and he gets plowed and run over by a train. <laughs> right. And all you see is the boot. But of yeah. course, you know, Solomon Grundy doesn't die. You know right, I mean? right. So, and then, of course, you get to the end, and you got the whole ju- uh, Justice Society showing up, which was a cool image. I love the Flash. Yeah, yeah. Wonder and Woman. The Jay Garrick design, to me, has always been kind of really cool. I love the helmet. Yeah, it really has. It's 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 a, it's a standalone. And then that's pretty much the end. And then they walk away in the, in, in the sunset at the end. Well, in the city, anyway. I don't know. I liked it. I liked the art, and I liked how, I liked how Alan Scott was drawn in this. And we go back to what you said about I like the shading, you know. It's just it was a good standalone story, and it was kind of cool to see Solomon Grundy again. I I don't think he's in much these days, and it's kind of nice to see old characters like that reappear. I think it was it's just neat to you know so many times they want to take a character like this, and they want to tell him a story in the, in the modern time frame, and you know it's definitely a period piece, and it, you know with with all the 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 kookiness that that implies, but it's also a really neat nostalgia trip because you're not going to get more stories set in the 1940s unless somebody's creating them. There are no more stories to be found. So it's almost like, yeah. it's almost like you found a book from the 1940s that nobody knew existed. They forgot about. Well, yeah, because I mean, that's what people wrote about back then. Nazis in a, in a swamp and you know, stuff like that. You know, that's, that's how their writing was. And you know, it, it's kind of cool. Like in a way, like, to see these guys throw the throw obviously throw the homage to to finger and nodell and everything like that but it's kind of interesting that it was only a standalone just one you know and it was a quirky story you know it didn't stand out it didn't it wasn't earth shattering <laughs> it did there's no big reveals and there's no cliffhangers but it was a standalone story just for one trade paperback just for one book what yeah, it? yeah. It wasn't a, it was an earth shaking event. It was just a a simple story of good and evil. Yep. So good stuff. Good throwback. I kind of was like, at, I, I I was at odds on what I wanted to do my retro review on because you 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 thrown out that bone with Alan Scott, and I was like, I was like, well, okay, I got to keep it in kind of the same theme. So, yeah, it worked. Yeah, I think so. It's definitely a fun book. So. Good issue. I still miss. Uh, I still miss reading the new ones, so. though. <laughs> yeah, I I wish they would take this book and they would either make it available, um, again in trade paperback. It has not been reprinted, so the only way you can find it right now is to find it used, or uh, if you might luckily find a comic shop that actually still has a a new copy of it, which I would hazard a guess at this point you're not going to find. Uh, you have to find it, you know, secondhand. Um, Do you know if uh, if Alan Scott is uh, collected? There have been um, some Golden Age archives, and there's been some of that stuff that's that's been done, but none of the newer things that I'm aware of. Yeah, I figured I figured it wasn't the newer things. I figured a lot of the Golden Age stuff would be like the Justice Society collected and stuff like that. Yeah, there's definitely some of that, and um, yeah, the, the, I, I hope they do more. I'm hoping with this being the 80th anniversary, I know there's an 80th anniversary uh, hardcover coming out. That isn't going to be just Alan Scott, I'm sure. It'll be like much like the 75-year book, I'm sure, but with some new stuff added. Uh, I hope we get some reprints. I, I haven't seen anything announced yet, but, uh, you know, it's only January. Who knows? Yeah, that's true. Here's All hoping. Right. So let's take a quick pause, and we'll come back, and we've got some listener feedback. All right. Sounds great. This is Razor, and you are listening to the blog of Oa. You need to keep listening. Otherwise, I will track you down with all of my skill, and you will feel my wrath. 
right. Thanks for coming back to the podcast, Tavoa. Uh, Phil, my friend, we have uh, an email I got from one of our listeners. Uh, his name is Ben. And uh, I'm going to read his his, uh, his email. So it says, hey, Myron, longtime fan since 2011 here. Was listening to the podcast episode number 152. And I heard your take on Far Sector. And I had some thoughts. Read if you happen to have a moment. And uh, we always have a moment to listen to what, to what our, our listeners have to say. Uh, he says, uh, believe me, when you're a fan who wants to take the premise of Green Lantern seriously, it's natural to want to ignore Far Sector because of the too many Green Lanterns argument. But have you seen the reviews it's been getting? Pretty well written, beautifully illustrated comic. Yes, it's not going to fulfill a fan's desire to see the modern Green Lantern mythology heavily referenced and built upon. However, if you love Green Lantern because of the space police angle, rather than the space army angle that we usually end up seeing, then Far Sector is as Green Lantern as you can get. It's really... As a really imaginative police procedural story. Remember when we thought Grant Morrison's Green Lantern one was going to be like a police procedural, but it turned into the typical Green Lantern sci-fi craziness, not knowing Morrison, his run is obviously spectacular. Well, Far Sector actually does it. Very rarely do we see Hal Jordan called to a planet to solve a major crime anymore. This comic deals with the confusion of trying to solve a major crime in a hard-to-make-sense-of alien society. It's implied that Lantern Joe, a rookie, but a pretty great detective, is on the planet because the Guardians don't want to just wave a hand and solve the less advanced society's problems. They want the people of that planet to learn how to help themselves to some extent, and Joe is there to supervise. All this is to say that this is a pretty interesting thing happening in Green Lantern lore right now that I'm sure some fans are interested, and I wouldn't just wave it away. I like the Simon Jessica Green Lantern series. It is written with clear competence, and even Green Lanterns had its audience, like Felbova. <laughs> and I, I, I get not wanting to support a first diversity series, but I don't think logistically the book would attract as many new readers if the main character were an alien. And also, there's nothing so far that confirms that this takes place in continuity, so that's hardly an issue. I'd be interested to see what you think of the story, and if it really seems like a waste of time to you, then I'd understand dismissing it. Thanks for reading, and thanks for running the best Green Lantern fan community on the web. Ben. Uh, so, Ben, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to jot your notes to us. And thanks for being a listener and thanks for following along. Uh, I, we wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for you guys out there uh, making this a part of your fan experience. So uh, I definitely appreciate that. Um, I, I am I am not reading um, Far Sector. I think I said that before. Phil, have you read it yet? Yeah, I read uh, I read number one. I read the first one. I haven't read the second. I think I don't know if they're on three or not. I can't um, three it. comes out this month. Three comes out this month. Okay, mm-hmm. so yeah, I read the first one. I I enjoyed it. I like I like Sojourner. I I think she's she's a good character. You know, I I mean I think it's I don't know. Like I'm at odds. I'm with you with the whole Green Lantern thing. You know, you and I have the same opinion. Where you know we're we're true to form. You know, we want we want the tie ends. We want we want the Hal Jordan, the the John Stewart, the Kilowog, the Guy Gardner, and we want all these characters that be on the big screen and we want to be re- reading about him and stuff. But like I try when I read Ben's comments and stuff, I had to take a step back myself and realize, you know, Hey, I'm reading far sector. I read the first one, you know, and I might, I might chime in on that legacy to see what it's like, but I understand from a different source standpoint that they need to start targeting audiences and different kind of people and they're and very diverse people when it comes to green lantern. So I think that's what they're trying to do, and they're taking different markets when they do it. I just, just think an opinion. It, I just think it's a shame. And again, this is my personal opinion. I think it's a shame that people can't seem to un, to be able to relate to a character unless they're just like them. Um, and and you're right. You're 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 absolutely right. You know, and and I totally agree with you. And and but, you not know, that I want to see every up good point. Right. Not, not that I want to see everything homogenized, but um, it's a, it's a mythology that's already more than full. So I look at anything new like that as a uh, it, it's you're you're diluting the pool essentially. Why not make a new character or why not use an existing character? Would an alien uh, driven book sell? Um, probably not. Probably not. Um, you'd only get the hardcore people probably. Uh, but to me, I guess it's the whole. Uh, I used to be I used to be in a Star Trek fan club and we used to do fan fiction. And I used to have a real hard time with members of my club who 
would want to be uh, a, a Vulcan because it's cool, but they wanted to be a Vulcan with emotions because they didn't want to be hampered by trying to write the tougher thing of being someone who suppresses their emotions. And and I I had a, a saying that I used to use in that club that you know if you're going to live by the ears, you got to die by the ears. You can't have all the the positive stuff and not have the the, the reality of it. And so I I find things like this where. Um, the same thing is true in the Green Lanterns book. Sam Humphreys didn't know a whole lot about Green Lantern. So I'll just ignore the parts I don't know about or understand or are convenient for me to ignore and create things that are new just because it's convenient for me. So I, I struggle yeah. with that. If you're, if you're going to write a book that's in, that's in a universe that has established rules, then follow the rules. But whatever. Um, is it a good story? I don't know because I, ha- I haven't read it. I've seen the reviews are good, but we also live in a day and age where if that book was awful, it would still get good reviews. Sadly, um, that, that's good the point. world we live good in. Point. That's the world we live in right now. Um, does that mean it's a good book or a bad book? I mean, that's always in the in the eye of the audience. Uh, you know, I, I, for those that are reading it and enjoying it, more power to you. Um, I might pick it up later in trade, uh, just because I am a completionist and. You know, maybe there's something to it. Is it in continuity? Um, certainly there's some references. Uh, I think the cover to the second issue had John Stewart on the cover, a figure of John. Um, is is it in continuity? I don't know. You know, if the rumors about 5G are true, it is in continuity because rumor is that she's going to be the Green Lantern for this 5G effort that's going on. Is that true? Don't yeah, I? which I've, I've, I've heard another ridiculous rumor about that, that that uh that's where green lantern's going to be resorted to is the black label and there's not going to be another print yeah i, I who, who knows this one? i mean dan didio is actually doing some damage control right now and talking about how there's a, a lot of misinformation out there and uh my comment to dan didio not that he's listening to this podcast was if you don't like the misinformation that's out there then give us some actual information uh yeah that's a good point you're right <laughs> you're totally right but anyway, uh, so, you know, I appreciate the comments. Um, you know, I, I hope that my comments don't discourage people from picking it up and, and, and reading it. I don't want to discourage anybody from something that they're, they think they might enjoy. Um, but I also have people that are going to look at the show saying, well, how can we not talking about it? And my, my reason is, is because... <sighs> I, everything that I review, I pay for out of my own pocket. I'm not like um, the, the blog of O is not like comic book resources or a host of other comic book websites. They get their books for free digitally five days before they come out. Um, they're basically given free, free books to review. Uh, I buy them with my own money. And if I'm not buying it with my own money, I'm not going to rewrite a review on it because that would be uh, that would lack integrity. If I don't read it, I can't I, I can't really comment on it. Uh, so that's why I'm not, you know, the same thing happened with, um, you remember the Larfleys book? I think I bought the first three issues. Um, I felt obligated to buy it. Uh, even after the first issue, I didn't like it. And I I thought, well, I'll give it three issues. And I got to the other third issues and I'm like, I maybe, I don't even think I made it to three. I might only made it to two. I said, this book is so bad. I'm not, I'm not going any further with it. I'm not going to endorse it with my wallet. And I'm sorry for those that might be looking to me to do a review, but I just can't do it. Um, and sure. I, I, I kind of feel that way here, not that it's bad cause I haven't picked up to try it, but I disagree with it in principle. So, um, I will pick it up later and try it when, when my, my dollars won't matter as much. Um, but you know, again, I mean, it's, it's good. I mean, it's good and it's, but I, I'm with you. I mean, I don't see the point, you know, and I'm of the same opinion with it. I just, I like it because it's I don't know, it's interesting. And I was, honestly, I was looking for something different to read because I'm yeah. sick of not reading Green Lantern stuff, you know. Well, when you only got one book right now, it's hard. But, uh, you know, people know. like what they like. And I, like I said, I don't want to discourage anybody from enjoying it. And I don't want to sit here and criticize it. I can't criticize it because I haven't read it. I can only I can only talk about how I disagree with it in principle because that's all I've got. You know, I, I wouldn't sit here and tell you it's a bad comic because I, I haven't read it. I can't tell you that. Um but I'm, I'm just not going to endorse it either, you know, but it is what it is. It is. You're actually absolutely right. All right. Well, uh, as always, I appreciate anybody taking the time out of their day to uh, write us a comment or leave us a voicemail um, and, and being a part of the show. Appreciate it greatly. Yeah. And that was a good one, Ben. No, I mean, he, he makes a lot of good points. Oh yeah, so absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and, and, and he's very on point about the whole uh, space police versus space army for a long time. It became space army. I remember when Jeff Johns started his run, you know, they talked about having the sector houses and it was very police driven, but it quickly, once you got to Sinestro Corps war, it stopped being that. 
Yeah. Um, once you're right. War, I agree. Once the war came, it became an army and it never looked back. Yep. That's a good point. You're, that's right. accurate. All right. Well, my friend, um, probably we will be talking in a couple of weeks when the book comes out, depending upon when little Simon gets here. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully we'll get together. If, if not, um, I've got a fallback plan if you're not available. So we're okay there. Um, okay. But uh, I, I, I sure I'm sure I, I joined the rest of our listeners in wishing you and your wife nothing but the best of luck in, in your upcoming arrival. And we're looking forward to hearing um, the confirmation of little Simon's name. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know you just didn't confirm it already? <laughs> <sighs> All right. Well, uh, I'll keep you posted. Uh, you're not but a text message away. So I'll keep you posted on everything and let you know what happens. And uh, we'll go from there. All right, my friend. So uh, we will be talking soon, I hope. And uh, until next time, everybody, uh, we're in a brand new year. So you got to make sure you keep that power ring charged because, uh, you know, we're in a leap year. We got an extra day. So you got to make sure you keep it charged. Uh, treat each right. other well. We, you know, we live in a world today where we people don't treat each other very well. We can each one of us make a difference in the world around us just by treating each other well and make every day your brightest day for yourself, too. And we'll uh, talk to you guys soon. The Podcast of Oa is the official podcast of the Blog of Oa and a proud member of the Comics Podcast Network. Share your comments and questions by calling the show's voicemail line at 406 Pod of Oa. That's 406 763 6362. You can send your emails to podcast at blogofoa.com. You can also find the Blog of Oa and the Podcast of Oa on Twitter and Facebook. Green Lantern and other related characters are the copyrighted property of DC Comics Incorporated and are used without permission. The Blog of Oa and the Podcast of Oa are fan productions and do not claim any ownership over the Green Lantern or any other copyrighted properties.